Good morning, TIAG. Welcome to church. Um, we're so excited to have you here this week. Please join us and stand for a time of worship. Fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, 
and we will shout it out, shout it out. Church, sing it. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, there is a and we will shout it out, shout it out.
singing like you mean to say, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Hey, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Say, people from every nation. People from every nation and tongue, from generation. Say, people. People from every nation and tongue, from generation. One more time. Say, people. People from every nation and tongue, from generation. We worship. We worship you. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Sorry, I need to sneak around the front and kick this thing. Somebody say amen.
estás, debemos mover y adoraré, y adoraré. Aquí está obrando en mí y adoraré, y adoraré. Milagroso, milagroso, abres camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Te llamamos, milagroso, abres camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. You are here, say. Say way we make a praise. We make a miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Say we make a we make a miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. Camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Wey. Milagroso, abres camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. God wants them. He's our way maker. You still do miracles. You turn our lives around. Somebody just lift up some praise to Jesus right now, right where you are. Lift up your voices and praise the King. Because he's done everything. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all who see our name, how great is our God. Come on, 
congregation will need you. Help me sing our praise, oh God. Worship team, let's sing it quietly. How great. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God. Come on, everybody, you know this one. The splendor of a king. You sing. The splendor of a king. Clothed in majesty. Clothed in majesty. All the earth. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all, all the earth, earth rejoice. He wraps himself. Worship team, just drop down. Let me hear the congregation say how great. How great. Sing with me. Is our God. One more time, sing how great. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Just bow our heads this morning. And I 
as you're here, would you make this a personal prayer? Would you just speak to God? And would you just begin to thank him? A lot of times we, we might be in service we and we don't know what to do. We don't know. We might not know just what to do, but it's it's just talking to God. It's just talking to the Lord and just saying, Lord, I thank you. The easiest way to work, to grow in our relationship with the Lord is just to begin to thank him. So there's there's a reason that we have to thank him. If we're awake this morning, it's a re- it's a reason to thank him. If we have breath in our body, it's a reason to thank him. So can you do that for the next for the next minute? Can you just speak to the Lord in your own way? Don't worry about the person next to you, but in your own way. Can you just begin to, to thank him? Thank him for life. Thank him for, for waking you up. Thank him for his blessings. Thank him for protecting you, for covering you, for 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 healing you. Maybe the Lord has healed you in your life. Maybe there's a, a moment that the, the Lord has provided for you. Can you just begin to thank him? Thank him because he is a great, great God. And if he and if he never did anything else for us ever again, he would still be a great, great God. And so, Lord, we worship you. We praise you. Jesus, we exalt you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Lord, we invite you in, God. Lord, we invite you in. Holy Spirit, have your way with us today. Lord, I pray that we would have a real encounter with you today, a personal encounter with you today. Lord, we love you. We need you, God. We need a fresh touch of your spirit in our lives, Father. Lord, you are the source and the center of our lives. So, Lord, may we experience your love and your grace today. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And everyone said, amen. Come on, and everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, can you put your hands together for the Lord this morning? Amen, amen. You may be seated, worship team. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Maybe just hang out up here. All right. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to CIAG. It is so wonderful to have you with us this morning. My name is uh, Pastor Stephen. Uh, with my wife, Pastor Erica, and uh, we're just so grateful and honored to to be here to worship with you this morning. Hey, if you're worshiping with us for the first time today, I just want to say welcome. I want to say thank you for joining us. And uh, if you are here for the first time, there is a, uh, you, on the way in, you should have received a little bulletin. And inside of the bulletin, there should be a card in there. It's a connection card. I'm going to ask if you, if Uh, You can go ahead and grab that connection card. As a matter of fact, if everyone can go ahead and grab that connection card, if everyone can grab that connection card, and I want you to take it out. Now, wave it in the air for me one time. Wave it in the air. Wave it in the air if you got it. Okay, if you got it, wave it in the air. All right. Now, on the back of that card, there's uh, two little boxes. One box is for any prayer requests that you may have, anything that we can pray and agree with you for. And then the other box is just a box for any questions you might have. Um, any questions you have, any comments, feel free to put it in there and uh, we can take action on that as necessary. But on the front side of that card, for those that are visiting with us, if you could please kindly fill out your information there and check the little box that says, um, I'm new here, or it's my first time here at CIAG, just so that we can meet you after the service and say hello and uh, just meet and greet you and answer any questions you have about CIAG this morning. Okay, so... Uh, I do want to point our attention to every Wednesday night. So everyone say every Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night, we have a small group that meets here at CIAG. It's called Living Free. Now, I think, Chris, Melissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, we are doing the topic of dating and marriage right now. All right. So dating and marriage, if you uh, if you want to go and talk about dating and marriage in a biblical context and how the Lord uh, has perfect plans for us even in that I invite you to come out every Wednesday night at 6 30 p.m. at our offices in town it's in the Genesis building it's in the Genesis building in town it's actually going to be here's some insider information behind the new Starbucks in town but you haven't heard that from me all right <laughs> what's that it's oh it's public it's public so you did hear that from me <laughs> so that'll be an easier uh, reference it'll be behind the new Starbucks in town it's in the the Genesis building uh, there 6 30 p.m every Wednesday night feel free to join us it's a great the group is growing 
um, and it's a great time together. So I just want to invite you out to that. Now, um, parents with kids, uh, kids, you have your own uh, service. You have your own kids church. We have kids church and then we have the nursery the nursery is available right next door we're getting ready to dismiss uh for the the kids the the nursery is right next door in theater two and then across the hall in theater three is our is our big kid service from five to twelve i believe it is right so mr anthony will be out there is that mr anthony miss kim miss kim can we give it up for miss kim miss kim does so much for the church and we're just so grateful for Miss Kim and Miss Denise. Man, we have a great, great kids team. And so what I'm going to invite all the kids, um, parents, feel free to come along as well. If you're new, you want to check it out. I'm going to dismiss the kids to come and meet us here in the uh, in the front. The kids will line up and then we'll go ahead and, and uh, take the kids over to Kids Church. But what I'm going to ask is everyone, if you could please stand this morning. Come on, let's shake off the cobwebs this morning. I know it's Sunday morning. All right, so if you can please stand, find someone next to you, give somebody a handshake, give somebody a hug, welcome them to church this morning. got a good looking church, huh? <laughs> Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Well, as the, uh, the, the kids and the parents are, are making their way to the, to the other theater, we just want to transition here as we continue in the time of worship. Now, when I say worship, I don't just mean the songs up here that we sing, even though that's great, but we're going to move into a time of asking God to bless our giving, right? Now, giving is a part of worship, okay? Giving is a part of worship. Scripture teaches us that if we are followers of Christ, one discipline of the faith that we do is something called tithing. Now, tithing is, it, Scripture teaches it's the 10% of all that God gives us, right? So, Pastor Eric and I, every month we give our tithes to the church, the 10% of what uh, we've received that month in income. And that's a sign of trust to the Lord. It's a way that we worship God, right? Now, please let me just uh, say it this way. If CIAG is not your home church, please don't, don't feel pressured to give, but we do just want to give everyone an opportunity on the way out this morning. Um, on the way out, you can give in the offering buckets or you can even give online. There's instructions on the screen behind me, but also in your bulletin. This is another way of worship. In 2 Corinthians, it says, be a cheerful giver. Don't give as if you're forced to give because how many know that God doesn't need our money? Amen. God doesn't need our money, but he, he asked us to trust him because the Lord can do more by himself than we could ever do. Amen. So when we trust him with our lives, when we trust him with that which he's given to us, it's a way of saying, Lord, I trust you. I worship you. And I believe that you're going to bless me because of it. Amen. Well, can you just bow your heads with me this morning as I pray and ask the Lord to bless our, our giving? Father, I thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I thank you that this is an opportunity that you've given to us, God, to worship you in our, our, our tithes in our offerings. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you will bless each giver, Lord, whether they've given in person, online, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you will bless each one, that, Lord, we would walk in that obedience to give to you, to give to your storehouse. It doesn't go to a person. It doesn't go to an organization, but it goes to you, Father. It goes to your church, to your people, back into the work of God. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Now, before Pastor Erica comes, I am excited for today's message. She is my favorite speaker ever, my lady. Um, uh, she's going to give you some more details, but I want us to point our attention to the screen. We're going to play a quick little teaser, 
And once we play this teaser, Pastor Erica will come and she'll share a little bit on this teaser and then she'll get into the message. All right, please point your attention to the screens. So we're really excited because coming up, starting the 1st of September, um, starting the 1st, September 5th, it's a Sunday, um, we are starting a new series called Decisions. It's how to discern decisions. I know the tagline probably was different, how to discern God's direction, I think is how it says, how to discern God's direction when it comes to decisions. So we're really excited for this particular series. It's going to be a six-week series, so you don't want to miss it, but something special we're doing during it is we're going to be having small groups um, outside of Sunday morning that go along with the Sunday service. So um, we're going to give everybody in the congregation an opportunity to sign up for um, a um, a, a, a small group that meets outside of Sunday morning. We'll bring more details. Um, and uh, hey, if you're interested in saying, you know what, maybe um, I don't want to lead a group, but maybe I want to host a group. I want to open up my home. Just let me know. Um, you can send me a WhatsApp or you can just let me know if you just want to open your home just for this um, next six weeks, once a week. But we're really excited for it. Nonetheless, we'll get into more details in, in the next couple of weeks of this series and we'll do a proper sign up who wants to be a part who's leading the group we'll let everybody know but um we just want to let you know that's starting september 5th the first week of september well good morning uh ciag um i have the awesome privilege of of, of sharing the word today with you um so uh just please smile and nod your head. That helps me up here as I'm, as I'm speaking, as I'm talking, okay? Um, but today's message is called, Why Do We Hurt the Ones We Love? Pastor Steve always gives me the hard ones, so I'm, I love you, dear. Thank you so much. Uh, why do we hurt the ones we love? We're currently in a series called Real relationships, real relationships, I think it's how you say it, but the, but the real, you know, it, the real part of how you say it is real, basically real relationships. So today's is week two. Ha, uh, why do we hurt the ones we love? Um, you know, we're in this series for so many different reasons, but God has purposed us to be in relationships. Matthew, the greatest commandment that Jesus gives, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Um, Javis and I, I jumped a bunch, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm way down. Um, sorry about that. But basically, Jesus gives us the greatest commandment. Um, he says to love God and love others. So that teaches us that relationships matter to Jesus. Relationships matter to Jesus. Matthew, that's Matthew 22, 36 through 40. God uses relationships in our life for so many reasons. Relationships can be the biggest blessing of our life, but guess what? They can also be the biggest heartache of our life. But God uses relationships in our life uh, for, if one, he creates, um, he uses it to create protection in our life through accountability. God uses relationships to create protection in our life through accountability. It's hard when you are accountable to someone, it's a lot harder to not do what you're gonna, what you say you're gonna do. I'm gonna give an example. I wasn't gonna give this, but Davison and Claris last year, um, they in June last year, uh, day, I was at their house for something, and um, I basically we were talking and we were outside just talking, and I remember Davison goes, "Hey, are you gonna do the half marathon in December?" And I, and I can't, you know, of course I like to run or I liked to run, I'm not running right now, but you know, it's like, you know, I'm not going to say yes to that because, you know, if I say yes, I mean, I really have to do it. And I wasn't in the mindset to do it. He's like, well, okay, well, if you do it, you know, uh, let me know. So we were just sitting there talking and he's training for it, you know, and 
So I was like, oh, okay. So I sat there. I was like, you know what? I'm, uh, I'm going to do it. And I don't know why I said that, but I was like, I'm going to do it. So I said yes. And so from there, Davison and Claris, we started a whole group chat with that, my husband. He didn't do it. He just supported me. And he, uh, and, but the point is, is can I do it? Davison and Claris, I'm bringing them up because they're monsters when it comes to working out. They're, they, they'll randomly text saying, yeah, I just did 22 miles this morning. I think they do it. Or like, or, you know, one day Davison, I think you said like a hundred miles or something. I don't know, but all I know, some of the, I don't know if that's exaggeration. That's not exaggeration, is it? Right, right, biking, biking. Yeah, so biking I'm talking about. So point is, is this is, I'm saying this for a reason. So I said yes to this whole uh, running half marathon thing. And I've said a lot of yeses to a lot of half marathon things, and I never really do them. But this one, because I know that they're both so... Um, experts in this area, there was something in me that did not, that I felt so accountable to them. I felt so like I, there, I, that I'm on a schedule. I'm supposed to text every Tuesday and Thursday and Sunday after my run and say, I completed the run. I did this. I'm sending the times. And there was something about being accountable to them that I actually in December did that half marathon trained and everything and my body was actually prepared for it um and i'm saying that because the only reason why and this is why i kept telling everybody is the only reason why i i completed that thing was because of the training and because of claris and davison because i knew they were gonna they were really nice if i missed my run but i knew that they held me accountable to hey did you go running okay you have tomorrow to do it and because they were a little bit ahead they were way ahead of me in this area so God purposes relationships in our life. He purposes them. One of the biggest things is to create protection through accountability. There's a protection um, in our life that God uses. Ecclesiastics 4.10, I'm just setting this up for a reason. Ecclesiastics 4.10 says, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Many of us are going through life just with maybe just your spouse and no one else in your life is is there. Maybe you're just going through life just alone. So this is why God has a purpose for us to be in relationships. He uses it to create accountability in our life. Another thing um, that God uses and purposes relationships in our life is he uses it to give life, to speak life through wise counsel from, from, from friendships that are godly. Um, it, they basically, they point us back to God. God uses relationships in, relationships in our life to point us back to God. Another thing that God uses relationships in our life is to bring companionship through relationship. God uses relationships in our life for so many purposes. But this is the thing, church. Like I said before, relationships can be the best thing, but they can also be the things that bring the biggest heartaches to our life, the things that can be the biggest tensions in our life. Um, and we know that even though relationships can be the hardest and most painful thing in our life to deal with, we know that the, the, what God has purposes for, there's a purpose on the other side of a godly and healthy relationship. But there's something that happens, and I know everybody in this house has dealt with this before. There's something that happens that destroys that godly relationship. It destroys a healthy relationship. There's something that happens between husband and wife, mother and son, sister and brother, mother and daughter, um, sister, sister. However, there's something that happens in relationships that maybe one time it was so good, but, uh, but then something happened and that relationship isn't what it was maybe the relationship got broken maybe the relate maybe the maybe that particular relationship ended in divorce maybe that particular relationship ended in abandonment ended in um, just complete separation whatever it could be something happens in relationships that that relationship ends up being broken and what we found is the thing that destroys relationship is a big c word and that's called conflict but it's not just conflict that destroys relationship. It's, re it's conflict not dealt with 
correctly. That's what destroys relationships. Not just conflict, but when conflict is not dealt with correctly. When conflict not dealt with correctly, that's when we hurt the ones we love. So church, that's what we're talking about today. How, how do we, how, we're talking about how do we deal with conflict? What is conflict? Um, how, how, how is, what are the wrong ways to deal with conflict? And what, how does God want us to deal with conflict? And what does his word speak about it? So I'm just going to open up with a word of prayer. And then we're going to get right into the word. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, I'm thankful, God, for who you are, Lord. I'm thankful, God, for your mercy, for your grace. Father, for your love for our life. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I just pray, Father, as we open your word, as we speak your truth, I pray, Father, that you just do your work in our heart. Do only what you can do, Holy Spirit. Your word says that it's the truth that sets us free. So I pray that you use today's word, Father, as something that is so specific in someone's life. Father, that this is the, this is the word, God, that they were waiting for, God, that whatever it is, God, that this, Father, was the word they were waiting for, God, to help maybe mend a broken relationship, God, to help maybe, Father, just speak so specifically, God, that gives them direction, God, in, in whatever they might be facing, God, I pray. Lord, we love you, God, and we just invite you, Father, into this message. And Holy Spirit, I just ask for your truth to be spoken today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. 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 John 16, says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I am putting my timer on. Church, you know how it is. We got to get this timer on. Um, all right. We'll do. Okay. I think I did that right. All right. So um, in this tr- world, let me just start again. John 16, says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world, Jesus says, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In this, in this world, we deal with many things. But some of the biggest things that we can deal with in this world that bring most strife and bring most conflict and hurt to our life is when there's strife between relationships. Um, Not to say that other things don't bring us trouble, but some of the things that we found is when, is the things that when it has to do with people, relationships in our life, those things are the things that really bring us the greatest trouble in life. Church, conflict is inevitable while we are here on earth. Um, Let's just talk about what is conflict and where does it come from? Um, in other words, why do we, like I said, conflict, we, we, we hurt the ones we love in the midst of it when not dealt with correctly. So what is conflict and why do we hurt the ones we love whenever something happens in our life? Um, why does it always end up being where there's an attack or maybe I hurt someone? Conflict, the, defi- the definition for conflict is a serious disagreement or argument. Um, another way to say it, they say it's a clash. It's a clash. Um, what are some reasons we deal with conflict here on earth? I'm just going to give you four points of why we deal with conflict here on earth. Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Right up to the present time. God's original plan for humanity, and we know this from the Garden of Eden, it, Eden, it it was not all these natural disasters that we're seeing. But we fell, humanity fell, from our original position um, that God created from the Garden of Eden. And now we live in a fallen world. And all creation, as Romans 8.22 explains, all creation now groans um, under the consequences of sin. It's a groaning. Um, So one of the reasons why we deal with conflict here on earth is because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world, so conflict is going to be inevitable. So when we live in a fallen world, uh, it, it means that we still struggle with sin. We still struggle with our fleshly nature. Our fleshly nature is not the prettiest part of us. Our fleshly nature is the ugly part. Our fleshly nature is our selfishness side. 
our fleshly nature is this pride side. It's when there's a disagreement that happens and I have to be right. That's your fleshly nature there. When there's an argument, when there's a disagreement, that something in you that wants to attack the other person, that wants to tear that person down, that's your fleshly nature at work within you. The part in you that can't control your tongue, that just wants to take control again, you know, that you know exactly what to say to get that person, that's your fleshly nature. So one of the reasons why we did, we're going to unpack that more, but one of the reasons why we deal in a, we live in a fallen world, when, you know, my husband just messed me up because I'm looking, I didn't expect to see you right there. So I'm like, hey, sorry, dear. Um, but one of the reasons why we deal with conflict is because we live in a fallen world. Another reason why we deal with conflict is because of the growing com- comple- complexity and diversity in our, ro- in our world. There's a growing complexity in our, in our world right now. We're seeing that th- rampant through social media, um, through news. The growing complexity, it's almost like in our world today, I don't know if you feel it or not, but it's almost like the world wants you to decide what side are you on. It's very black and white to the world, right? And if, you, if you're on this side, that means we're friends. But if you're on that side, no, we can't. We saw a lot of that in 2020 we faced, and you're seeing it now. Vaccines, the, think of the world topics right now, right? Um, those, that's what we're seeing. There's a complexity. And I say complexity because there can be a confusion behind it. And so what the world says is it's black or white. What side are you on? There's one right way, one wrong way. So there's a growing complexity that creates conflict in our life. Um, and the another reason we said growing complexity and diversity, diversity, we see diversity creates conflict in our life. Because there's different backgrounds, there's different up, different upbringings. When we're doing marriage counseling, sometimes the things that we're having to counsel are the differences because it's two different backgrounds. One's from maybe um, a, a society that is more individualistic, and the other is of a society that's more c- collectivistic. So it's more community, and the other one's more individual. That can bring a, that can bring. That diversity brings conflict because one value of a marriage can say, one person can say, well, you know, the role of the woman, you know, what's that role supposed to look like in different, in different marriages? Another, the other partner can say, well, no, this is what I think is the role. That's a, maybe a lame excuse, but that's very real. You know, it can be what is um, that, the diversity in marriages, diversity in relationships, um, that can bring conflict in relationships. I remember one time I lived, when I first moved out of our home, now I'm from the States, but my family, our background is um, is Spanish, is Colombian. So uh, I was born and raised there, I mean, you know, but you still have the influence of your of your Latin parents, you know, you what you eat, the values, right? So I remember when I moved out, I moved out with um, some of my closest friends, and they're all, you know, they're blonde haired, blue eyed girls, you know, it's, and so we, we used to struggle in the house. Why? Because their background, whether it was German, we're all from the same city, born and raised, but their background had different values than my background. So my background, I don't know if there's anyone in here, but when you came home in our home, you made sure every day to, you go find your mom, you say hello, you go find your sibling, hey, I'm home. You don't just go home in my, in my upbringing, and you don't just go home and go to your room. You, if your parents are on the roof, you're going to go to the roof to say hello. You know, that's how it was. Um, my friends didn't have that upbringing, so this was conflict when we first lived together because they would come home, and they would just go straight to their room and just do their thing. And I would think, oh, my gosh, they might be mad at me. You know, your mind goes. And then after a while, I just thought they were rude. So, uh, so really, it took us working it out. Um, with each other to say, hey, this is just how I was raised. And, and I didn't demand them to say hello to me. I just began to understand they're just from a different culture. Even though we're both born and raised in the same city, we had different values that were taught at home. Um, another reason why um, there's conflict in relationships that we deal with is simply because we're not in control of everything and everyone. If one person was in control of every single relationship in their life, there probably wouldn't be conflict 
but that's not, that's not reality. And the last reason why we might face conflict in this world is because of perspective and personality. And that it is good to note that there are two different types of um, where two different places where conflict comes from. The first area where conflict comes from is from our differences and personality. That's not a sin issue. But then there's another side that James speaks about in the, in the word, which is our main passage today, and it's our selfishness side. That's the sin side. So this fourth perspective, personality and perspective, this is not a sin issue. This is just differences that people can face um, and can bring conflict. So we're going to dive into a biblical example of this, but simply there can be some people in the room who are very direct. They speak very direct. They just want you to talk to them. Give it to me black and white. As direct as you can, don't go around the roses. And there's other people who are in the room who are like, no, no, no. Give me the, through the roses. You know, be kind when you speak to me. Why do you have to be so direct? There's other people in the room who value being thorough. And you don't like to make mistakes. And you like to make sure the plan is written out before you take action. But then there's other people in the room who are saying, we got to go. The details will sort them out when they get sorted out, but we got to go. Let, let's go. Let's move. And those moments in teams, in relationships can bring conflict because there's, there's value in both. There's value in having the plan put together before you go take action, but there's also value in going and going and doing it, and the details will work themselves out. Be so, you know, there's, there's value in both. And you need both. So those are different personality types um, that there can be conflict. Um, and we can see this in Paul and Barnabas, Acts 15, 36 through 41. It says this. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all of the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Philanthia. I should have practiced that word coming in. Sorry, church. Um, and had not continued with them in the work. So you, okay, I was going to make a bad joke there, but let's keep going. They had such a sharp disagreement, verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Verse 41, he went to Syria and to Cecilia, excuse me, strengthening the churches. Now, Paul and Barnabas were at a disagreement here, okay? They were at a disagreement here. And this is where in scripture we can see that it, that this is Paul and this is Barnabas. You know, sometimes you think, with the conflict is terrible. We're not supposed to have conflict as believers, but no, Paul and Barnabas are different types of people. We don't know exactly what happened to John Mark in this. We don't know what exactly John Mark did, but there was something that we can gather from this, that John Mark did something in their first mission trip that didn't rub Paul right. He left somewhere. So you can gather, you can kind of gather what happened. He did something that he disappointed Paul. And Paul, we can gather from how he writes. Paul was a guy who was, let's go, let's take charge, let's let's go for it. He was very just ambitious and, and let's go. And think about it. If you have a Paul in your life and then there's, when you're a Paul, you want people around you who are going to be like that, who are going to go with you, who you can depend on, right? Paul's action, very action oriented. Then you have Barnabas. Barnabas is um, what we gather again from scriptures, Barnabas seems like a, a gentle, um, a gentle um, type of demeanor. Barnabas seemed like somebody who maybe he was driven, but he kind of comes off as somebody that was merciful, gracious, somebody that almost that pastoral heart. Why do I say that? Because Barnabas in this story, he kind of defended John Mark saying, no, 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 Paul, let me give um, John Mark, another chance, I'll take him with me, okay? I'll take him with me, and I'll bring him under my wing. And Paul, I, Paul's like, I'm not taking him with me. He slows us down. So do you see the difference? Who in here agrees with Paul? 
You got to keep going. He disappointed us once. Somebody showed their character. We got to keep going forward. Who in here would say, I can get Paul. I can understand him. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, there. Yeah. Okay. And then then you have Barnabas, the pastor, you know, that let me bring you under my care. It's okay. You messed up. Man, there's second chances in the Lord. You know what I mean? Just get back up. Who in here is the Barnabas who would take, who would totally take him under? Right. Okay. I'm totally Barnabas. Pastor C is probably Paul, just so you know. Um, but you'll totally take them, so just make sure you're, I don't know, I think we both could be both, actually, yeah. Okay, I think everyone can be a mix of both, right? So, point is, is Paul and Barnabas, it's not to say that one was right or one was wrong. They just had different personalities, and, di- and God used both of them. If Paul always stopped for the one that was on his team that just didn't follow through, Paul probably wouldn't have advanced as, as much as he did, but if we didn't have any Barnabases, who would be the ones reminding people of God's grace or saying, come on, let me just, par- you can do this. You know what I mean? That extra encouragement. So we need both. Ultimately, like I just said, conflicts um, come from our differences. So our personality and values and, um, sel- and our sin side, so selfishness. So selfishness is our sin side, but there's also a not sin side that conflict comes from. James 4, 1 through 3 says this, and this is the sin side of conflict. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you, do, when you, when you ask, you do not receive Because you ask with wrong motives. Because you ask with wrong motives. James gives a really clear picture. He he really unpacks it to the heart, to the soul for us. We have, we do not have, so we kill. We don't physically kill, but with our heart, we we do. No matter what, this it's gonna be my way type of heart attitude here. No matter what, I'm right. That's kind of the heart here at James is saying this comes from our selfishness, our, our fleshly nature, our desires that we still have with us. It's dead with Christ, but it's an ongoing process of sanctification. That's why we're not yet perfect. So let me just say this about conflict. The myth about conflict is that conflict is bad. And the truth about conflict is conf- God uses conflict in our life to refine our character. God uses conflict in our life to refine our character. What does it mean to refine our character? To grow us in the likeness of Christ, to grow us in the fruit of the Spirit. Whenever conflict happens now, I have learned to walk away and say, okay, God, because it's hard. When, When something hits your pride, when something hits your fleshly nature, I've learned to walk away and say, okay, Lord, I've learned with you that that has nothing to do with the person. So what in me, God, are you doing? Are you using this to, to, why did this bother me so much, in other words? And do you know that if you sit back and think about the season you're in, the same conflict that keeps happening to you, the same thing that keeps rubbing you the wrong way, Rather than looking at that person for so many years, then looking at the situation, it's that fault, it's his fault, it's his organization's fault. Rather than looking at those issues, that's the issue. Could it be that God is allowing it to expose the condition of your heart? Could it be that God is allowing it so that he loves you too much to keep you there? So he's allowing it so that he can lead you out of that, lead you out of the hurt place that maybe your heart is in that area. Conflict that happens in our life will always be used to refine our character. God will always use it. Conflict doesn't just happen, you know, maybe to happen. But what I'm, what I'm saying, church, is rather than looking at conflict with our fleshly way, our fleshly way just wants to stay there and say, I'm the right one. I um, This is why they're wrong. They're the selfish ones. But our, but 
the other side, God wants us to, to, that's our fleshly side that we have to say, okay, God, I resist that side because it's not about why I'm right right now. God, why does this bother me so much? I remember one quarrel Pastor Steve and I had, um, and I remember he said to me, he goes, okay, so do you want me then? I remember I forgot, you know, woman, you know what we get upset about, right? So he said, I, I say that's a joke, church, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> that was good. So he said, um, so he said, he, I remember he said, and it sounds so silly, but I remember he said, I forgot, I honestly forgot, but it was something, I wanted something partic particularly, like I wanted him to do something like in a certain way, right? So Pastor Steve looked at me, he goes, okay, so if I, he goes, is that what you want me to do then? Because it was one of those resolutions where we weren't getting anywhere. He's like, so is that what you want me to do? And I remember when he said that, I thought to myself, I was like, well, that's not going to solve the problem. And I'm just sitting there, and I didn't say anything back, which happens. And I'm just pondering. I'm like, oh, this is not about him right now. And it was just, it was, it's your flesh side. So what I'm saying, church, is that's a funny situation, but it's so true. I once heard someone say, do you keep arguing, arguing when you know you're wrong? Do you keep arguing when you know you're wrong? So all that just exposes our flesh side when we're dealing with conflict, when we're dealing with conflict. So conflict, when dealt with correctly, can I just say, when conflict dealt with correctly, it unites the relationship. When conflict is dealt with correctly, it unites the relationship. Jesus teaches us this um, in Matthew 18. He says, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him, work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you make a friend. Conflict has a way, when it's dealt with correctly, to unite the relationship. Conflict has a way to deepen the relationship. When, and I'll always use my husband, because it's the closest example I have, Pastor Steve is the one who really taught me how to deal with conflict, and it was through our marriage, and I'm grateful for that. Why? Because he, he dealt with this heart issue before we got married, right? He dealt with this, this the, the, the I have to be right, but he, he approaches our marriage as it's not about me being right. It's, it's, it's I love Erica, so what, what is this about her life? So I say that because he really helped shape this for me, a godly perspective on conflict. And at the end of the day, I'm saying this because conflict will deepen the relationship. Because if I do something to harm James, not intentionally, not realizing that I harmed him. Maybe I said something to him. Maybe James is a guy who his, his area that maybe gets him low is when somebody, James, I don't, you know, my bad. I'm just, you know, I, okay. James is like, hey, I, um, what gets James low is when somebody um, critiques his performance right, critiques his, the way he plays or sings. And I happen to say, you know, James, um, um, that, was a, that was great what you did up there, but um, you, you were kind of sharp most of the, most of the worship set. Um, I don't know. You say something that critiques him, you know, or maybe, James, you're just too much, you know. Just kind of tone it down a little bit when you're worshiping, right? You're just a little too much. James, if he has an issue in his heart that hasn't been dealt with, that, that, that he already feels like, maybe incapable or maybe he already feels that's an air that he feels like he you know he got critiqued James will probably take that to heart and he'll probably he'll probably bring him in a spiral in his mind and make him go maybe eventually be be in offense with me but let's say James that's not his issue he's like okay I was sharp okay I'm gonna I'll try working at that next time I'm too much thank you for you know okay 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 I uh, got it noted um so let me just I'm not ever going to say you're too much, right? But the point is, church, is if that was a part of his heart, of his life, that he always was raised maybe with criticism or things like that in that area, and he tried really hard in that area, and I went and just nonchalantly said something that maybe hurt that area, do you know that that situation still has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with James? Because God allowed it so that God can say, I'm exposing, remember, the condition of your heart. James, why did that bother you so much? Oh, well, she could have said it nicer. She could have, okay, she probably could have. But James, what's going on? Why does that bother you so much? The Holy Spirit is our counselor. What do counselors do? They ask questions that get you to the root 
of what you're dealing with, to help get you to the root of what you're really feeling. Holy Spirit's our counselor. So he's there asking us, drawing us, but James, why did this, why did this hurt you? Getting us to the root of it. Why? Because when we get to the root of it, church, what happens? Change, freedom, we experience healing from the Lord. Because the Lord doesn't, doesn't just expose the condition of our heart and leave us there. He doesn't just expose, okay, yeah, you, it, when you get rejected, it's a trigger for your life. So he doesn't just leave you there. The Lord takes you by the hand. And if you continue the process of healing with him, he leads you to his truth. He leads you to healing with the Father. So I'm saying that, church, because conflict, when dealt with correctly, it deepens the relationship. It unites the relationship because after James dealt with whatever it was, he's going to come at me. Rather than being mad at me, if he dealt with it correctly with the Lord, he's going to come to me like, hey, I got to talk to you, Erica. So it turns out that I, in my life, I, you hurt me by something you said, but it turns out that that was actually had nothing to do with you. God used it to bring healing to an area of my life that I didn't even know was there. So what I'm saying about James is after that, James just did that Matthew principle. He came to his brother. Guess what? When James comes in that heart, he's not attacking me because it's not my fault anymore, right? He could have made it my fault. by This is what you said. And, but James came to me and he said, but it had nothing to do with you. But listen, you hurt me. Now guess why did that deepen that relationship? Because now I have understanding. Ah, that can be a trigger for him. So I'm going to be sensitive in that area and learn to speak differently. If I know that hurts James that particular way, I'm going to be aware of that and sensitive. Why? Because I love him. If I know something about my husband, Steve, I love him. So why would I do something that hurts him intentionally? If I know something bothers him, I love him. So that's, that's that Matthew principle worked out. We're going to dissect that more. But when conflict dealt with correctly, it brings healing to the soul. It brings healing to the soul. We just explained why. Because when it's dealt with correctly, you go to the Lord and say, God, why did that bother me so much? Why, why is this just weighing on me so much? The Holy Spirit is our counselor, and he will lead you. The, the another th reason why conflict, when dealt with correctly, what it does is it grows and matures the person. So just like we saw in the example of James, after James dealt with it correctly with the Lord, he's now stronger. He now has greater understanding of himself. The, when conflict is not dealt with correctly, there's things it does. It destroys the best of relationships. Something so small can, can make a forest fire. When conflict not dealt with correctly, it brings the vision. Have you ever witnessed the best of relationships and something happened, who knows what, and now that best relationship has now ended in maybe uh, in, in division. It's ended in... Um, and just hurt and offense, why does that happen? Because the conflict wasn't dealt with correctly. It brings division. Um, conflict ultimately hurts those, when not dealt with correctly, hurts those that are closest to you. Why? Because conflict ultimately, I'm going to say a strong word here, but I still want you to love me after this. Conflict not dealt with correctly is immaturity. At the end of the day, when conflict is not dealt with correctly, it really shows immaturity in a person's life. Why? Well, I'm going to give you some examples. Conflict, when not dealt with correctly, we kind of talked about this a month ago. It assumes others' motives. It's a heart that says, you know, I, I, um, it's a heart that says, you know, this is what they're probably thinking. I know them really well, and they were, mm -mm. I'm assuming their motives. When conflict is dealt with immaturity, it induces guilt. Well, this is how you made me feel. Um, how, how could you do that to me when after everything I've done for you, you know, language like that, I'm putting guilt on someone during conflict. That is not the correct way of dealing with conflict. Another way that we, that when we're immature and we're dealing with conflict is we discredit the other person's motives. Well, I know they said sorry, but I don't really think they're sorry. Um, situ another way is situation is handled, though another way the situation is handled immaturely, when we start to attack their character. 
they are so selfish. You punk. I'm sure we use we can use stronger words, right? But we're in service. So you punk. How could you how could you do that? Um, it's all your fault. Uh, I'm gonna I'm I and then we're talking, I'm gonna give them a piece of my mind, you know, when I see them. How could she have talked to me like that? It's um, it's we are we can attack their character. It brings another thing when it's dealt with immaturely conf, immaturity conflict. It brings other people with them. It brings other people with them when you're dealing with it immaturely. So if something happened, man, James, you know what? I'm going to bring James with me. Oh yeah, that's true. She did say that. Yeah, she does kind of walk around. It brings other people with them when it's dealt with immature in an immature way. Um, it conflict when dealt with. Im- um, Im- immaturely, it amplifies pride in our heart. And amplifies pride just means these are the reasons why I'm right. And these are the reasons why they're wrong. This is why I'm right is the heart that, that amplifies that, uh, pride in our life. This is why I'm right. It's almost like you're in a courtroom when you're in a conflict. And you are there pleading your case of all the reasons why you're right and, and all the reasons why they're wrong. Conflict, when not dealt with correctly, it avoids. It avoids the person. It avoids um, the situation. So rather than dealing with it, I just don't deal with it. I'm just not going to talk to them on Sunday morning. I'm just going to, you know, just kind of keep my distance from them. That's not dealt with correctly. So we're going to talk, we're going to close today's sermon with how to deal with conflict God's way. And this is my favorite part about this. How to deal with conflict God's way. Because God wants us to deal with conflict in our life his way. He wants us to deal with it in our life his way. Why? Because like I said before, God allows things in our life to shape us and refine us into his image. That's why he allows it. So when I'm in a quarrel, like I said, with James or with my husband, when I walk away, it's not really about them. And I tell Pastor Steve this all the time, something I always say, because God's taught me this, whenever I go and pray to him, um, whenever I go to pray to the Lord about a situation or conflict I'm in, and let me ask you, church, whenever you go and pray to the Lord about a situation of conflict you're in with somebody, has God ever told you, you know, you're so right? No. Never. Even when you've been hurt, God doesn't sit there and say, you know, you're so right. Even when you're the right one, he doesn't. Why? Well, the first one is how do we deal with conflict the godly way is we have to have the attitude of Christ. Philippians 2, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. Jesus was a perfect example of a man who was right, but Jesus didn't approach this world like Hebrews teaches us, he being the very son of God. He didn't look down on everyone, I'm the son of God. That wasn't Jesus. Jesus, he humbled himself, even when he was right up into the cross, right? They ridiculed him, saying, you're a liar. With, with the crown of thorns on his head, they mimicked him. They mocked him. They, they put crowns on, the, on his head to, to mock him. You're the king of the Jews. Here's a crown of thorns for your head, you king. That's how they treated him the whole time. Jesus, knowing he was the king of the Jews, knowing he was the savior of the world, knowing that he was the solution to their, to their life and to their problem, knowing that Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus didn't say anything. And not many of us could do that, knowing we're right. If knowing we're right, think about it if you're in the position, I know that I'm right, and someone's saying, mocking and ridiculing you, that's very hard to do to, to not defend yourself. And I'm not promoting here you don't defend yourself. There's a place for that. We're going to learn it in this. But Jesus walked in humility. He walked in humility, his heart, a heart that, that says, I'm going to put your needs ahead of my own. So what does that mean practically? Like I said, if I know something bothers Pastor Steve when I do it, because I love him and because I'm for our relationship, 
if I know he doesn't like something that I do, guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to try to convince him to be okay with what I'm doing, like what we try to, what a lot of people do. So if I know he doesn't like something, I'm not going to be like, well, this is why you should be okay that I do it, you know? No, because I love him, I'm going to approach him and say, and with his needs above my own and say, okay, if he doesn't like that, I don't understand it, but help me understand why. Isn't that a different way to approach it? Me and Pastor Steve, Steve has never, ever attacked my character. He's never yelled at me, Erica, you're a it, you know, what a, a jerk, you're a, he's never done that. And, and, and I say that because, again, he worked this stuff out before we got married with his character with the Lord. So because of that, I don't do that to him. I don't attack his character. I don't attack who he is. So we approach things very much like, okay, well, why does this bother you? Does it mean our pride doesn't get attacked and stuff? Meaning like, you know, when, like I said, something bothers you and you're like, okay, humble yourself. Okay, Lord, I really need your help right now. Of course that happens, right? Probably more so on my side than his side. But, you know, the point is, is it, I, I say, okay, God, it's not about me being right now, Holy Spirit. Why does this bother me so much? And nine times out of ten, it's always something that God's working out in your life, in my life. Jesus walked in mercy. He walked in mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is not getting what we deserved. So when someone comes to you and they're truly trying to work something out with you or there's a conflict, Jesus doesn't treat us saying, you know, you're so wrong. These are the reasons why you're wrong. You don't deserve forgiveness. You don't deserve this. He approached it. He extended forgiveness even when the person didn't deserve it because he's for the person. And then Jesus walked in love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. Love is patient. It's kind. It, it doesn't seek. It, it's, not, it's not selfish. Love thinks about the other person. So Jesus walked in love. So when we're dealing with conflict, imagine if you applied those, those in the midst of the conflict, if you applied the love principles. Am I being patient? Am I being kind? Am I being gentle in the middle of this conflict? Or am I just looking at how wrong they are? Am I just looking at not forgetting, am I exposing their past? The second thing when you're dealing with conflict and how God wants you to deal with in a godly way is to check your motives. Philippians 2, 3 to 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. That's so good. Rather, in humility, what does the word say? Value others above yourself. How do you value others above yourself? In humility is what scripture says. So in humility, that's how you value others above yourself. You need humility to do that. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. It's stopping for a moment and saying, okay, how does this bother them? Help me understand why this, why this bothers you the way it does. James 4, 1 through 3 says, what, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So the question I keep asking, why are you really upset? Is it really have to do with the keys? I don't know. I'm just saying, right? Does it really have to do with um, the, 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 the small things? Whenever there's a quarrel, does it really have to do with what it seems, right? It's a complement versus competing with one another. So it's a, I'm in this not to win if I'm in this quarrel. The goal of this is not for me to win. The goal of this is for me and you to walk away with this, understanding each other. We cannot deal with conflict with our flesh, church. We can only deal with it with a Christ mentality. We cannot deal with it with our flesh. We can only deal with a Christ mentality. Number three is you go to the person. Matthew 18 says, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him, work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. Now, I have to say this when talking about this point. I have witnessed people do this wrong. I don't, I'm sure you have too. They go to the person because they're doing the Matthew 18 principle. 
but they but it's awkward and it's it's almost like they're still looking to place blame on the person. So what am I saying? Going back to our James, our James, um, this James, not the Bible James, but this James, going back to our James example. When when James was hurt, let's just say with me, that was an example. Um, when James was hurt with me, he had a decision to make to say it's her fault. So he could have gone to me and he could have we're not dealing with the Lord and just come straight to me and just say, this is how you hurt me. And so if I wasn't, if I wasn't mature, I would say, okay, James, um, well, I wouldn't be empathetic. I wouldn't understand. I wouldn't try to, to reason with him. I would just be like, okay, James, and I'll probably walk away offended, right? Because it's like, what, what was that? But if I, if James goes to the Lord first, and deals with it with God and allows the Holy Spirit to be his counselor. And then he realizes, man, that had nothing to do with her. God, you're using this too. And then God does a work in his heart. He comes back to me. Hey, Erica, um, so you last week I was hurt. But I just got to let you know God used it in my life to actually do an, a, a complete healing in another area. Awesome, James. And then that my heart to him would be like, all right, so what was it about it? Because now my role, I'm going to try to understand him. Hey, so what, what, you know, what was it? Cause I, cause I love James, right? So what was it, James? So I know next time to be sensitive in this area because we're in this together. So if I know this bothers you, I'm not going to speak to you like that. I'll find another way or whatever. Right? So the point is, is I've seen so many people do this wrong. I've done it wrong before you go to the person, but you go to them before you go to them too soon. And then it, it and, and you go to them too soon. And when it's too soon, it actually does more damage than, than good. So you have to go to the person after you've dealt with it with the Lord. But in addition to that, church, let's say you dealt with it with the Lord. Can I just say this as well? If you dealt with it with the Lord, guess what else? You, you, got, you, you have to go back to the person. Because if you dealt with it with the Lord, then and you don't go back to the person, when you come back to that situation, What's going to happen is there still won't be peace because that person probably knew that, that, that you hurt them or that they hurt you. So if I just go on my glory, I dealt with the Lord, I'm actually good, right? But I never went to Davison and said, hey, we're good now. But I treated him terrible the first six months of the year. But maybe June I got healed with the Lord and we're all good, we're walking. But I never go back to Davison. Davison probably felt that I was mad at him. But if I never went to him, after I got all healed up, I'm not practicing the Matthew 18 principle. If I come back to a setting after God healed my life and after I was able to forgive, I have to go to Davison and say, Davison, I got to let you know I was hurt, but I just want to let you know that I'm not anymore. God dealt with me. It has nothing to do with you. That is so important for a relationship. I think there's a reason why Jesus tells us to go to the person. So sometimes your healing church comes after you, let's say you dealt with it, or I forgave them. I don't got to talk to them anymore. Did you know that the second part to your healing will be completed when you actually go to them and say, hey, I just want you to know I forgave you. This hurt me. Sometimes, I remember um, our, one of our pastors from Fort Lauderdale, Pastor Candy, she said, she always said this. She goes, I've experienced people that they didn't get their freedom in, from, from true forgiveness with this person. Um, they dealt with it themselves, but they didn't get it until they went to the person and say, hey, or a simple message, hey, I forgive you. So for what it's worth, church, what if that's the part of, the, of your healing that you're missing? The f last couple issues, and then we're going to wrap up with prayer, is focus on the real issue, not attacking the person. So when you're dealing with conflict, the thing you want to do is attack the person. But you have to focus on the real issue. Attacking the person is just going to amplify the other person's pride. The last one I want to say is move in the, or two more actually, move in the opposite spirit. To move in the opposite spirit, Matthew 5.38 says, you have heard it, it, it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and make your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Love your enemies. You have heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Another, another um, 
Um, another gospel says it when he says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Another gospel um, in, in, the, in the word basically says eye for eye, tooth for a tooth, but it says to trust the Lord who is our um, defender. And it uses the word defender. And when you move in the opposite spirit, move in the opposite spirit basically means what your flesh wants to do, you move opposite of that. So my flesh wants to take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. My flesh wants to get revenge. But God's kingdom is different from, is different from this world's kingdom. God's kingdom says, I am your defender. You're actually not supposed to defend. I'm your defender. So God's kingdom teaches you to trust in God, to be your defender. And, and so that's why when we move in the opposite spirit, your heart with all of you might want to say, no, but I'm so right about that. But God says, let me be your defender in this and watch me work. The last two is trust in God, not the person to change. Trust in God, not the person to change. Your trust in God, oh, my goodness. When you trust in God, that is your secret in conflict and not the person to change. So if you're dealing with somebody, you're like, Pastor Erica, you don't know who is in my life who I'm dealing with. These principles will not work. Listen, when you, when you trust in, um, when you, James, if you can help me out. And when you trust in God and not the person, that is where your freedom will come from. Why? Because if I have a difficult person in my life, and we all do, like Pastor Steve spoke about last week, the EGR is the extra grace requires. My, when I look at them, if I keep my eyes on them, and they're the really difficult person, and these are usually the ones who are closest to you, and you're like, no, I, they're, they're not going to change. That's just who they are. If my eyes stay on that person, I'm going to continue believing that because it's true. But when my eyes move from the person to God, it's totally different. Because then it's, you know what, God? In their ability, they can't change. But God, you have taught me and I have witnessed your changing power. So I keep my eyes on you because in them, no. But in you, you're able to change. You're able, Lord, to humble a heart. You're able, God, to work in their life that teaches them that maybe what they did wasn't correct. God, you're, whatever it is that you're telling God. But when I turn my, my eyes off of the person to change and I put it back on, when I turn my eyes off the person and I put it back on God, it frees me from carrying the burden of that conflict and relationship. Because my faith is not in the person. My faith is in God. So if you're a, in, in the spouse today and you're like, we're on the brinks of divorce. It's done. They're not able to change. This is how they are. If your eyes stay on the person, church, it, your situation will stay like that. But when you shift your faith to God, God uses that to say, put your attention on me. See me work. I can work. I can touch their heart. Just put your attention on me. But what situations do in our life, conflict, what it does is it does the opposite. It takes our eyes and puts it on the thing. It puts it on the person. All the reasons why they're not going to change. It's who they are. It's impossible. But church, when you put your eyes on the Lord for the most impossible people, that's when your faith connects with God. And do you know that faith is a currency of heaven? So when you begin to pour faith and deposit faith, deposit faith, deposit faith, that's when God moves and you see it. I have seen it with my eyes, church. People who you never thought would change. But when you stick to prayer and you, and you stick to, that's the last point, is you pray specifically. That's why I said stick to prayer. Because when you stick to prayer and you pray specifically, God is in it to teach you his children. He's in it to teach you. When you pray specifically, God teaches you through that specific prayer. He wants you to pray specifically. When you pray, God, change this person, that's good, but it's not specific. When you pray, God, bless this person, that's good, but it's not specific. But when you pray, God, I pray in the next couple of days, Lord, that I see something specific happen, Lord, that I see a sign that they're changing. 
God, I pray that in the next couple of days, Lord, that you just begin in his room, in her room, to humble her, Lord. And while she's reading her word, speak to her heart. That's specific. Why do I talk about specific prayer, prayer and changing lives? Church, it's because I witnessed it with my own eyes. There was a day I was 19 years old. And the Lord put on my heart to pray for my dad. My dad was so far away from the Lord, we didn't even know where he was. And I remember that those three days, that I remember the Lord put on my heart, and I was only 19. I didn't have a good prayer life. I was just 19. But I remember I was like, okay, God, I'll pray for my dad. And and I I felt in my heart because I just learned to pray specifically. I said, okay, God, I'm going to pray specifically. So I said, God, I have no idea where the man is. haven't heard from him in years. Lord, wherever he is, I pray that you bring him to rock bottom so that he only has left to look to you. That was my prayer for three days. I also prayed for my sister because she was living her own life. I said, Lord, I pray that she gets fed up of her lifestyle. And God, I pray for my brothers. Those are my burdens that, that those weeks. I said, God, I pray for my little brothers, Lord, that you send people in their life to take care of them because I had moved away during that time. But the point is, I prayed, started on Wednesday, and I ended on Saturday. It was prayer and fasting. And I just started to pray. God was just teaching me. And why do I promote praying specifically? Because I prayed those three things. I said, God, that he may hit rock bottom, my dad, and come back to you. For my sister, I said, Lord, that she may um, get fed up of her lifestyle. And for for my brothers, that you would bring people in the the pathway. That ended on Saturday. And I ended because I got hungry. It wasn't anything spiritual. I was just hungry, so I ate. I'm saying this to be real with you, church. So on Saturday, um, my mom sent me an email. I was in Argentina when this happened, studying in, in theology school. And she sent me an email. She said, Erica, you'll never guess who called out of the blue. Your dad called. He says he's really hit rock bottom, that he's living on the floor of a guy's house in New Jersey, of, 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 of somewhere in New Jersey on a mattress. And he just, he wants to come home. And that was Saturday night. Then Sunday, my mom calls me crying, saying, Erica, you never guessed who called, but your sister called, saying she's really getting fed up of her lifestyle. And then all that week, my little brothers, because I was far away and I, and I missed them and I wanted somebody to take care of them, I kept, I was on Twitter, was, Twitter's pretty big, but Twitter was just getting big. And they were, they were tweeting saying, hey, Erica, taking a picture with, with my brothers. Hey, we got your brothers. Don't worry. We're taking church people. We're taking care of them. We just got them to go on this retreat with us. The point is, is when you pray specifically, church, God, God uses it to increase your faith in who he is. So when you take your eyes off of the person and onto God saying in their ability, God, I could never see you change them. And you put it back on God. God is able. God is able to humble the hardest of hearts. He's able to put people in situations that do make them hit rock bottom. It's only the Lord. So my challenge to the house today is to partner with God and stop doing things in your own strength and allow God to be the one to transform your life, to transform your relationships. And I can't talk about restoration without talking about the process of restoration. I'll end with this church. When you're in a process of restoration, sometimes we want the forgiveness to happen overnight. Sometimes we want that specific prayer to be the peak and that's the end of the story. But that wasn't the end of the story for for my for my family. There was about my dad did get eventually get saved that year. Praise the Lord. Him and my mother are back together. God bless America. Like, you know, he um they it's incredible what God did healed their life and their marriage restored. But the point is, church, is it's a process. There there's gonna be lows and values and valley valleys. And when you're in the valley, that's when you want to give it up. And you want to say, oh, they're never going to change. This is who they are. They're the most prideful person in the world. So selfish. But then when you're on the peak with God or on the peak of the situation, that's when your faith is there. But church, when you're in the valley, what you have to do with relationships and conflict is take your eyes off of the person and put it back on the Lord. Because when you do that, that's when you'll see God move. 
And it's not overnight, but it's a process. He uses things as a process. Let's just pray, church, and and because I know we're, we're over time. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for who you are, Lord. I thank you, God, for your reminder, God, of, of God, who you are, Father, and, and how you are able to transform the things in our life, God. I thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray for everybody in this house, God, who might be facing a conflict, God, currently. I pray, Lord, that we take our eyes off, Father, of the person and that we put it on you. You are the one, Father, who's able, Lord, to um, check the heart, to check motives. You are the one, Father, who's able, Lord, to protect our life. So even if the other person's motive is wrong, God, you're our protector. And you're the one, Lord, who's able to bring protection, God. And you're the one, Lord, who provides, Father. Lord, I pray for those, Father, who maybe they're saying, God, it's so hard for me not to get angry when dealing with conflict. And so hard for me just not to lash out lash out and attack. God, I pray for that person, that that person then partners with you, Holy Spirit, and you, Holy Spirit, take that person by the hand and lead them, guide them. If that's you, where you just say, it's just hard for me not to attack the person in conflict, your solution is praying specifically and asking God for help. So God, I pray specifically that this week, that you begin teaching that person a different way to react, that Holy Spirit, you do a work within the person and teach them and guide them to your truth. Lord, I just pray for the person who relationships in their life, it has been, Father, their biggest disappointment and greatest heartache. God, you are able, Lord, to bring restoration, Father, reconciliation, Lord, and I pray, Father, that eyes are taken off of it and put it on you, Lord. Father, continue to do your work in our life, God. We believe in you, God, and we trust in you, God. We love you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite my husband up to do the closing prayer. Amen. Can you give it up for Pastor Erica this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, before we go into our closing prayer, uh, let me just encourage you. We're in this relationship uh, series because we are getting ready, like she mentioned, to go into a time of small groups. So you'll hear some more information about that coming up. We have a small group that's ready to go already, which is the Living Free group on Wednesday night. Okay, Wednesday night at 630. Let me invite you to come out. But we're looking to expand that as we go into our decisions series. And let me just encourage you at the end of service, please don't run out. Okay, connect with one another. Say hello. See how each other is doing. Right. Compliment someone's outfit. Right. <laughs> Do me a favor, look at the person next to you and tell them, I'm glad to have sat next to you today. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And uh, many have been asking on a side note um, regarding our, our messages. So the messages that have gone out in the services with the worship, we're working with our technical team and with the media team, and uh, we're, we're looking to upgrade our live stream a little bit. So we're in the process of doing that. But I say all that to say that the messages are available on Facebook and YouTube. Okay, so just look for CIAG on YouTube or Cayman International Assemblies of God, and you'll be able to access the messages there. Amen? Well, I ask everyone to stand this morning as we get ready to dismiss, and we'll say our closing prayer together. So let's say it loud. Let's say it together. Would you say, Father, help us to be the people in the church that you have called us to be, a people that always build up and never tear down, that always encourage and never discourage a people in the church that take a message of hope everywhere we go to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, (laughs) amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for joining us this morning.